Welcome to this week's GCN Tech Clinic. This is where you send in your questions using the hashtag AskGCNTech. I pick some of the questions out and try and offer the best advice I possibly can. So let's dive into our first question. This is from Matthew Ho. He says, I've watched a few different videos about sizing the chain and nearly all channels suggest the largest cassette to the largest chain ring method. However, this method doesn't consider that if the rear derailleur has a modification like an OSPW or oversized pulley wheel system such as ceramic speed or jockey wheels which are larger than the stock ones. So if my rear derailleur has one of these modifications and I want to use the above method to size my chain, how do I know how many extra links to add? If yes, how do I determine the extra number? Um, so the first bit of advice I can give you is, yeah, using the largest sprocket to the largest um, chain ring method to size your chain, and then generally you would then add three additional pins to, to that measurement. That's fairly sound measurement of how to get your chain length correct. In fact, a few weeks back I did a video detailing how to get that done, so it's worth checking that out as well. And then if you have an OSPW um, or oversized pulley wheel system fitted, nearly all of them will have advice and guidance on to how many additional links you need to add to your chain. They all vary very slightly because they've got different size pulley wheels and different lengths. So you do need to check with the manufacturer of the system that you're using. But in most instances, it tends to be to add two additional links. So you can mark up your chain where it needs to be um, cut to length, then add those two additional links or however many your oversized pulley wheel system manufacturer recommends, and then you can drive that pin out and join your chain and it should be the correct length for the bike as you have it set up. Fairly simple, there you go. Next question in is from Law O. Oh, also another oversized pulley wheel system. They say, is changing to a bigger pulley wheel helpful? Does it improve pedaling and shifting? God, it's like buses. No questions about oversized pulley wheels for ages. Then two come along at once. And it really kind of depends on what you're determined by the mean, what, what you mean by the word helpful, I guess. Um, oversized pulley wheel systems aren't really gonna change your pedaling efficiency and I don't really think they're gonna improve your shifting performance. If you want the best shifting performance, you're best off sticking to the factory installed derailleur cage and pulley wheel system. It was all designed to work as one system and in theory, I think it will give you the best shifting performance. Pedaling efficiency is not really gonna change much using an oversized pulley wheel system. I think the big advantage comes from a little bit of chain efficiency and some of them claim to be more aerodynamic than a standard cage. So the differences between it all are quite marginal. So the easiest thing, stick to the original factory cage and you shouldn't have any problems whatsoever. Next question in is from Laurent Glogan who says, Please stop with everything in capitals. Um, yeah, I think we're just gonna enjoy using capitals. Hopefully, your question will be typed out in capitals. <laughs> um, next question in is from Ryan who says, Hi, I wanna ask about my wheels. I've done some servicing on the cup and cone bearings and managed to put everything back together in one piece. But then when I put the wheels back on my bike, I've realized that they are not balanced and they tend to stop rotating in a certain point. I don't know if my wheels had this problem before, have I done something wrong when I've been servicing the bearings, and is it safe to ride unbalanced wheels? Can you give me some solutions? Thank you, and stay safe and stay healthy. Well, that's very kind, thanks very much. Um, it is quite common for road bike wheels not to be perfectly balanced. I think because you've just serviced the hubs, they're obviously spinning far freer, and it's maybe highlighted that the wheels are slightly out of balance. But I don't think it's unsafe. It isn't anything to be concerned about. But if you want to check it or you feel like it's quite significant, or maybe you can notice it when you're out cycling, then the first thing to do is to remove the tires and inner tubes from your wheels, pop them back into your bike when it's in a stand, and then spin the wheels to determine whether it's the wheels themselves that are out of balance or whether it's to do with the tires and inner tubes that you've got. So you can try to determine what the issue is and then provided it isn't anything significant, like you can't face it, you'll know if it's significant if you can feel it when you're out riding your bike. Otherwise, I wouldn't worry about it too much. When manufacturers build the wheels, they often put an additional counterweight 
to balance and offset the difference between where the tyre valve would normally be. So that should kind of answer your question. Quite often wheels are out of balance. Is it anything to worry about? No, don't stress. Uh, next question in is from Harry Millad, who says, is chafing non-existent among cyclists or is it a taboo subject? I've been chafing for the past two years and I don't know what to do anymore. Using chamois butter, good bib shorts, bike has been fitted. Should I be changing the saddle or could it be a sweat problem? Chafing is definitely not a taboo subject if you ride a bike now and again, it's just gonna happen. Um, it sounds like you've tried quite a few different options and, and variations out there. The first thing I would normally say is to try using a good quality pair of bib shorts and then you could try some chamois cream. If you've already had a bike fit, hopefully you shouldn't have any issues with your saddle height because quite often if your saddle is too high, it'll cause your hips to rock and as such will create a bit of friction on where the areas that you're sat. Um, and you say, should you consider changing your saddle? Now, I would have hoped that when you had a bike fit, they would have assessed whether that saddle was particularly suited to your riding style and your body position. So that is definitely the next area that I would consider looking at. And if after all of that, you're still having some sort of skin irritation or chafing problem, head to your doctors, go see the doctor. They'll try and sort out most, um, most problems that you have. Because it could just be you have some sort of skin condition or irritation. So, Hopefully that gives you a bit of advice to help sort that out. Next question in is from Paolo who says, hey, are there any concerns with running a wider rim and tire on the front than at the back? I've just bought an older time trial bike and I'm running 23 millimeter tires with limited tire clearance at the back. I'd like to swap my deeper section road wheels which have 28 millimeter tubeless tires onto the front wheel when using a disc wheel on the back and I want to avoid redoing my tubeless tire setup every time, is that okay? Yeah, no concerns whatsoever. You can use a slightly wider tire on the front wheel to the back wheel if you wanna do that. It isn't the most aerodynamically optimized setup. Generally, you would find time trialists use a slightly narrower tire on the front and a slightly wider tire at the back. The reason for it being that the front wheel is hitting the air, so if you can reduce the width of it and the amount of air is disturbing, it should help you go faster. And then the reason for the wider tire at the back is wider tires tend to offer a slightly lower rolling resistance. And because it is effectively shielded by all of the frame and the air is already very turbulent, the wider tire doesn't have such an impact on the back. But in terms of you using your wide tire on the front, don't stress, it'll be perfectly fine. And if you're running it as a tubeless setup, yes, it is gonna be a pain to keep swapping the tire around and it makes a bit of a mess. So I guess the solution to that is if you wanna use a narrow tire and switch it around between different bikes and types of riding that you're doing, you could just use a latex or a TPU thermoplastic inner tube with a lightweight road tire. And these offer fairly comparable, or in some instances, lower rolling resistance than a tubeless tire. There you go. Next in, it's a question from Nick. Isha Wood who says, now the winter months are approaching and the roads will be grit salted, is it adequate to hose your bike down to get the salt off after each ride? Or should you use some products as well to get that salt off? And if you've got a soaked bike, should you ever use pressurized air in a spray can to dry intricate areas or does that risk blasting water into places that you don't want it? Or is there a danger of the pressurized air causing ice to form and um, some sort of expansion damage? Um, quite a lot of going on there. I wouldn't worry about doing anything special to wash your bike, just wash it using your normal methods and your normal bike cleaning products and then go about drying it in the normal way. I'd be a little bit mindful of using pressurized air to try and get some of the water out of the intricate areas of the bike because you don't want to run the risk of just blasting the air into the bike and then that in turn will just blast water into the bearings and past some of the seals because then you will run into a little bit of a problem. So the best advice I can give is to wash your bike, dry it using the same normal methods that you normally would, but maybe just take a couple of minutes longer to make sure you've scrubbed it all and washed it all away very thoroughly with clean, fresh water. Next question is from Paul who says, hi Alex slash Manon slash Ollie. 
good to cover all basis there. On my last ride, I crashed at 55 kilometers an hour going downhill. I've got bruises and gravel rash all over, but I take this any day over broken bones. God, well, I hope you're right. It sounds pretty nasty. Um, analyzing a video of my crash, I noticed that I hit an uneven patch of road and that threw my hands off of the hoods. Yes, I was riding on the hoods and I lost control. So the, my question is, is it safer to ride on the drops on a fast descent because you have more control and your hands are less likely to get bumped off? Um, well, I kind of feel like you've answered your own question here. Yes, the safest option when on a fast descent is to ride in the drops. You have far more control, your hands are more secure on the bars and it just puts you in a slightly more stable body position. That's why you see all the pros, as soon as they're descending any alpine or fast descents, they'll all be on the drops, gives them best control, best reach and power on the brakes. And also, in your instance, it should help your hands run the risk, avoid your hands run the risk of slipping off the handlebars. So hope that clears it up. I feel like you answered your question yourself and fingers crossed you heal up and are back on the road soon. So that was our last question for this week's GCN Tech Fit. Hope you've all found it helpful. If I didn't get to your question, sorry, and keep submitting it into the comments section down below using the hashtag AskGCNTech and hopefully I'll pick it up in the coming weeks. Right, see you next time.